Hello everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of the Westcott webinar series, which is being recorded on Thursday, April 9th. In this episode, we're pleased to present you with a market update from our Chief Investment Officer, Mark McCarran, where he'll share the latest insight and perspective. Additionally, we've invited Wes Krill to join our discussion. Wes is a Vice President and Senior Researcher with Dimensional Fund Advisors, otherwise known as DFA. Mark and Wes are going to discuss their perspectives on the current market conditions and the strategy behind DFA's portfolio management, and then I'll come back at the end to close out our update. But before we dive into today's program, I just wanted to share with you that all of our Westcott team members are well and safely working from their remote offices. Our firm operations continue to, to run smoothly during these unprecedented times, and we're proud of how quickly our team, our clients, our partners have all adapted to this new way of working. The day-to-day -day operations really do feel very business as usual, um, and it, although we are interacting through video meetings as opposed to face-to-face -face interactions much more frequently. I would now like to turn it over to our Chief Investment Officer, Mark McCarran, for his key insights on the current economic and market climate. Mark? Thank you, Carrie, and um, thanks for joining again. Um, this is our uh, update through uh, today. The markets are moving quickly. Um, but just a couple of key points to put everything into some framework and perspective. Uh, the first, um, it is very likely the U.S. will experience a deep economic contraction, uh, definitely in the first half of 2020. Um, you know, but the, the reality is that there may be a recovery later in the year um, as restrictions surrounding social distancing are relaxed. And this is a, a positive sign um, in the news flow recently, and we've seen some of that reflected in recent market activity, uh, particularly in the equity markets. Um, the equity markets seem to have stabilized for now. They remain quite volatile, but following the massive policy response, both US Congress and the US Federal Reserve, um, markets, uh, equity markets globally are well above their lows that uh, were reached on March 23rd uh, of 2020. So in fact, I think we're nearly as of today, almost 20% higher on the S&P, which really uh, does um, highlight the importance of sticking with the plan and being committed to a strategic allocation. Finally, in the fixed income markets, uh, news today and the last couple of days, um, there's been a lot of support by the Fed uh, to provide uh, funding and loans to states um, and counties around the U.S. and municipal bond markets and corporate bond markets that suffered from a liquidity scare uh, in, in March uh, have started to recover, um, and there's been uh, some stability there as well. Finally, um, that's good for the investment grade. It's good for the municipal bond markets. Uh, lower quality issuers still um, um, the outlook and the impact on uh, of this particular slowdown on those companies is still uncertain. And it's just a reminder, um, Westcott portfolios have very limited exposure there. So with that as a big background, we're just going to uh, move really into our conversation today with Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, we're very happy to have Wes with us. Um, I'll introduce Wes in a moment. But just to put some perspective around who Dimensional Fund Advisors are. Um, first and foremost, DFA uh, has been an important core component of Westcott Portfolio since 1997. Um, and what, what DFA does is they provide a passive, systematic implementation of Nobel Prize winning research uh, by Eugene Fama and Ken French. These are two academics who have have written the book literally on um, value investing, and uh, DFA has been able to provide that exposure to our clients in a very systematic way, and has done so very successfully over time. Um, just a little introduction uh, from us. Uh, DFA tries to and seeks to add value over time by taking advantage of three main, they call them dimensions of return. 
uh, trying to capture returns from a value perspective, the value premium, uh, the size premium, and the profitability premium. We're going to talk a little bit about these things in the, in the, later in the conversation, but just a very quick introduction. Value premium is basically the return difference between value stocks and growth stocks. Size premium, in a similar way, return difference between small companies and large companies. And the profitability premium is, again, the return differential between companies with high profitability and those with low profitability. So all that said, um, this is an important part of investing, uh, a very key component of Westcott portfolios. In fact, uh, DFA implements uh, this approach uh, in a systematic way across a large number of our component allocations. Um, you will see them in our U.S. large company strategy, U.S. small company, international large and small, emerging markets, global real estate, and the same systematic approach they take in taxable bonds and tax exempt bonds or municipal bonds. So um, it's really with, uh, with that as an introduction um, and, and a final sort of perspective on what's going on in, in the markets, we, we wanted to highlight uh, the, the style and the premiums that DFA focuses on. We have a picture here on this slide of the value premium. And we go back to 1980. And what we're showing here is the performance differential between value stocks and growth stocks. Um, and we're doing this on a rolling three-year period just to sort of even out some of the ups and downs. So to read this chart very simply is the difference between value and growth stock way back in 1980 to 1983. The difference was about 10 percentage points in favor of value. But you can see that that goes in and out of favor over time. Um, for example, at the end of the 1990s, 97, 98, 99, value investing was under pressure. There was a lot of demand for growth stocks. So what we saw was a underperformance of value or an outperformance of growth. That came roaring back uh, in the early 2000s and stayed that way for quite a long time. The last several years, however, there's been a, a flip. Uh, investment styles are moving into cycles. And what we're seeing more recently is growth outperforming value and accelerating a little. We're going to talk to DFA about this um, shortly. And we have the same chart here for small companies uh, outperforming over time versus, uh, large versus large companies. And that is also cyclical. So we see the same sort of dynamic happening in the late 90s where large companies outpacing small, um, only to see a strong rebound uh, in the early 2000s, and then back. Uh, to an underperforming on a small side or outperforming on a large side. And I think that framework, that investment styles like this go in and out of favor, um, really does allow us to um, understand what role DFA plays and also how, how we're able to capture uh, these cycles over time uh, through our use of DFA in the portfolios. So with that, I'm very pleased to say that we have Wes Krill, a PhD Vice President uh, with Dimensional Fund Advisors with us today. Um, Dimensional Fund Advisors is uh, headquartered in Austin, Texas. Uh, firm uh, size, there's 1,400 employees, 13 global offices, um, $600 billion in assets as of the end of last year, um, and have been around since 1981. And we already highlighted this, but really known for uh, their for their research. Um, and and Wes is a is a senior researcher with DFA. Um, uh, has a has a interesting background in, in, in material science and engineering from North Carolina State University, um, and brings that experience to his research role at DFA. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, Wes, uh, for joining us. Yeah, good morning, Mark, and thank you for having me on, and I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, we're happy you're here, too, and, and um, as I showed in the previous slides, you know, there's been um, a cycle going on in terms of, of value and growth and large and small, and um, with your 
uh, research background and, and uh, perspective uh, from DFA, it'd be great to hear your perspective on what's going on today. And so, you know, we have um, a few questions here that we'd like to just run through. And maybe the first uh, one is, is how has the current market environment, particularly the market volatility, uh, impacted DFA's equity portfolios? Yeah, I think the current environment is a great place to start because in your audience probably does not need me to tell them this, but it's been pretty extreme. And, you know, we even have a chart here that we can show to kind of put some perspective around how extreme volatility has been recently in markets. Um, if we look at this chart, which is showing rolling standard deviation for the S&P 500 uh, using daily returns, just to get an idea of how volatile the stock market has been on a day-to-day -day basis, if you look at where we were as of March 16th, and it's come down a little bit since then, but as of March 16th, the realized volatility for the market was the highest that we've seen, even higher than the global financial crisis of the 07, 08 period. So it's been pretty extreme. If we look at just the month of March, there were 22 days of returns within that month, and 16 of the 22 were greater than 3% for the day, or worse than minus 3%. So that's a pretty remarkable level uh, of volatility there. So, you know, again, it's important to think about the investment philosophy in the context of what markets do. So our investment philosophy, you know, we think of the hero of our story being market prices. Uh, we believe that market prices are the best prediction of what the market expects to happen in the future. And we believe that because they have so many inputs. You have hundreds of millions of investors every day agreeing to buy and sell at a particular price, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in trade volume on average in equity markets every day. And that allows the market to settle in to what they think is the best estimate for the future of all individual companies. Um, now that doesn't mean all stocks have the same expected return. And so then an additional part of our process is identifying stocks with higher or lower expected returns. Sort of like if you were going to loan money to all of your family members, and if you include your in-laws in this equation, probably not going to charge them all the same interest rate. So we think of stocks having different levels of expected returns as well. And market prices allow us to see that. So the premiums you talked about earlier, the idea that small cap stocks, that value stocks, the high profitability stocks have higher expected returns than their counterparts, you know, this stems directly from market pricing. If you pay less for something, or you expect to receive higher cash flows in the form of dividends or share repurchases in the future for a given purchase price, those are associated with higher expected returns. Now this framework is really important to rely on because that framework applies every single day. No matter what's going on within markets, no matter what's going on in the greater economy, if you pay less for something and you receive more in terms of cash flows in the future, that's related to higher expected returns no matter the market environment. So when we think about what we do in terms of dimensional strategies, I think it is important to first start with what doesn't change. And what does not change is that continuous focus on these stocks with higher expected returns. Now, I think market volatility also illustrates some of the more dynamic aspects that really need to be accommodated in your portfolio design and management and trading. So specifically, when we look at periods of time like March, where you have a lot of market volatility, what happens is the cost of transacting in markets increases greatly. So one way we can quantify that is what we call the bid-ask spread or the price difference between the lowest price, a say an intermediary in the market is willing to pay for your security if you wanna sell, and then the highest price that someone is willing to essentially pay or sell to you for a given security. And that price difference right there, let's take the largest securities within the US market. So what we call mega cap stocks, your Apples and your Facebooks, stocks like that. Those spreads that we often talk about are measured in what we call basis points. So one basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. The average spread for those kind of stocks might be one to two basis points. What happens when you have large volatility? Those, base, those spreads go up to maybe five or six or even seven basis points. So the cost of transacting can be much, much larger. And again, that's a major staple for our portfolio management and trading process is we want to have the flexibility to manage portfolios and to not be 
forced to buy or sell a given security on a given day. And so we think of our process, which has this built-in flexibility, uh, being especially well adapted to these types of markets. So all in all, I think the main crux of the story is that our investment philosophy is built to withstand these types of very volatile environments. And as such, it keeps us from having to make major changes to the portfolios. Now that's helpful. And, and clearly it's been a volatile period of time. Um, you know, maybe given uh, DFA's perspective on history, when, when you know, would a, a strategy like a DFA's approach um, be rewarded and, and when might it be under pressure? Um, and, and particularly, when do these value and size premiums perform well? Yeah, we've spent a lot of time looking at the performance of these premiums through time and to see to what extent they're predictable, uh, you know, in advance. And so, different valuation ratios. So when people talk about the price difference between say value and growth or how expensive uh, growth looks compared to value, you know, different people have suggested those are ways to anticipate how large say value premium was going to be. Um, we've looked at past performance for the premium. So if small caps have been on a tear lately um, or not so much in, in the case of more recently, does that have any information about the future premiums and, you know, we see by and large, there's not much predictability of these premiums. It's, it's unlikely that anyone can consistently predict when they're going to do well. So it's helpful for us to kind of look at the range of potential outcomes and to see how they differ for a volatile environment versus, versus one that's not quite as volatile. Um, the first way you can look at that is if you look during major market downturns. So if I look at uh, sort of peak to trough downturns of, say, 20% for a stock market, Anecdotally, you see evidence in both directions. So for example, during the global financial crisis from the end of 2007 through February of 2009, the market obviously was going through a very rough period, down about 50%. Size and value premiums uh, further added to that headwind. So small cap stocks and value stocks actually underperformed the market over that period. But if we go back to the previous major market downturn, which was in the early 2000s, from 2000 probably September of 2000 through September of 2002, the opposite was true, where we actually saw small cap and value stocks outperformed the overall market. And when we look at this in a more systematic way and just look at average premiums during big downturns like that versus their unconditional or full sample period averages, uh, the premiums tend to look very similar in terms of their average. Um, so in terms of what you get on average on a daily basis, they're pretty similar. What's not similar is the range of outcomes. The likelihood of getting a very, very large either size or value premium in either direction, positive or negative, uh, becomes about four times more likely when you're in one of these big market downturns. Um, so what I mean by that is if you have a premium for value, say of 1% per day, which is about 100 times its historical average, that happens in an unconditional type of setting, so not necessarily in a downturn environment. That happens about once a month, uh, during a crisis, it happens about once a week. Um, so they are more volatile than, and we think of that as even more of a justification to be continuously focused on these because when we get the good right tail aspect of those premiums, those outsized size and value premiums, we want to make sure we're there to be able to capture them. Um, another related question, and this is probably the one that investors are most concerned about as it pertains to the future, is what have the premiums done following these big downturns? And there the picture is, is pretty rosy, at least on average. So, uh, you know, Mark, you mentioned earlier that we have spent a lot of time um, quantifying the performance of stock markets after downturns overall. So what does the broad market do? And generally speaking, we see that they deliver positive returns. We see a very similar story for size, value, and profitability premiums, where they do tend to, on average, be positive over one, three, and five-year periods, whether it's following a 10%. 20% or in the case of what we saw in Q1 of this year, a 30% decline. So, you know, again, this is even more of a reason why we want to be continuously focused because a large part of the historical premiums uh, are due to these big realizations following some of these downturns. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and to be honest, I think we're seeing, although it's a very short time frame, a, a little bit of a bounce even in the, in the value and the size segments of the market already. Uh, let's hope that continues. Um, and I, the final question really is, is I know that given your approach and very systematic, very strategic, there's no major changes to approach, but what, 
what actions uh, does DFA and can DFA take throughout this period to, um, to add value? Yeah, as I was alluding to earlier, a lot of our process is really stress tested so that it's dynamic enough so that we don't have to really make kind of uh, rash changes in a reaction to the market environment. But there are some aspects of just our normal process that I think can lead to changes within the portfolio that can kind of help weather the storm. Um, so specifically, if you think about things like uh, the energy sector, you know, it's probably intuitive to many people out there that energy has been hit pretty hard throughout all this as oil prices tend to fall. And, you know, we have a built-in aspect of our process that looks at relative returns for securities compared to the market. So that stocks that are uh, falling very, very much in price, their valuation ratios tend to look more attractive in terms of more value-like securities. Um, and so if you have a strategy that is emphasizing low relative price or value stocks, you're probably going to look at these securities as being more, um, you know, I guess amenable to your portfolio. Now, the issue with this is that stocks have, that have had relatively poor returns compared to the market over about the past year, they tend to continue to underperform the market over a short period of time, usually a number of months. Now, this is a phenomenon we sometimes refer to as momentum. Has a long documented history in the academic literature. It's not very well understood exactly why it happens, uh, but it happens. We see it in the data. And so as part of Dimensional's process, we have built-in screens for this momentum, where if a stock is exhibiting very extreme negative momentum like that because it's been falling in price, we will delay purchases for that security. And you know what we saw in terms of the energy sector for many of our portfolios with a value tilt is we immediately begin decreasing our purchases in these securities because it might look like you would want to add more energy to a portfolio. But in our case, we were actually curtailing the purchases of those securities. And so things like that, our ability to control exposure to sectors, avoid catching a falling knife, as people sometimes call downward momentum. You know, these are all aspects that I think have been triggered based on recent market events, uh, but are really just part of the normal systematic process of the portfolios. Um, I think another aspect here is it really illustrates the importance of having a daily process. And what I mean by that is we evaluate what we want to hold every single day. One of the advantages to not having a very regimented index type approach is we can make changes or not make changes to our portfolios as we see fit and spread that throughout the year. And the big benefit there is being able to take into account the very latest market prices. Uh, what you're seeing in markets with this incredible volatility is exactly what we expect and hope to see in a marketplace. It is uh, encountering lots of changes in information, uh, lots of changes in the uncertainty, the risk aversion that they might have, basically their expectations for the future. And as those things change, they settle in on what we think of as a new equilibrium price, a new fair price for a security. And we want to be able to take into account that latest price. And so that that's a dynamic aspect of our process uh, that can lead to turnover within the strategy, uh, but is very much a normal part of our mess up uh, process. Fantastic. Now, I think, I think um, what you've highlighted there is the DFA approach, uh, systematic long-term, but also taking advantage of the day-to-day -day volatility in markets. So, um, you know, with that, we, we thank you very much, Wes, for your time and your, your insights. Um, and, uh, we're going to turn it over to Carrie uh, to wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, Mark and Wes. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was really great perspective on not only the current market environment, uh, but a, a great peek into DFA's strategy and actions and the role that DFA plays in our portfolio. So to all of you that joined us today, thank you for your continued trust. We, we wish you well in health and safety, and please know that the entire Westcott team is working diligently and tirelessly to help you and your family navigate these tenuous times. We are here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.